you know, Scotty, one of the most shocking and, and utterly, um, it, it's, it's not just shocking, it, it's, it goes far beyond that. This, this stunning thing that's taken place. We've seen groups like ISIS that have actually obliterated Christianity in that part of the world, the oldest place in the world for Christianity. And so we've seen that happen over and over, and this is one of those instances where, yes, it looks like they were targeted specifically because of their faith. And once we saw everything take place that has taken place in Syria over the last, what, six, six years now, um, we've actually seen, as I said, the obliteration of Christianity in that country, and also in Iraq. There were about five million Christians living in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, and most of them are gone today, and they were protected by Hussein. You know, it's interesting that you do bring that up because I don't think a lot of people in America understand exactly in Syria the roles that they play. And it brings up the idea that right now more than 3,000 Christians just last year alone were killed worldwide. And according to a study last year and from Georgetown University Religious Freedom Program, program, they said that Christianity is the leading community being targeted for their faith. Far-fetched. Here in America, every church, every corner, and possibly twice on most corners in the South, there is a church. So where is the outcry here within the evangelical, the Christian community, the Catholic community for their brothers, sisters and around the world? Why aren't they getting involved in and in, in getting more involved in this kind of foreign policy to protect those of the same faith? So I really believe that it comes down to a messaging issue. And I think that, you know, your last guest talking about the, the military industrial complex. I think the military industrial complex has done an amazing job of, of keeping this part of the story silent. I, I believe it's out of ignorance. They have no idea that what's actually the end result of these conflicts, the end result of regime change in Egypt, in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq, is the extinction of Christianity. You know, in, in Syria, the, the, the Christian movement there is literally the oldest in the world. It is the first place where Christianity, after it left Jerusalem, it went to Antioch, which was in Syria. And, and it's over 2,000 years old there and it's almost completely gone. I think if Christians in America realized what was happening, they would take a step back, but the, the messaging has been so good to silence that information that many of them just don't know. I'm watching what's going on the world stage. I'm looking at the fact that Germany, France, and a bunch of other European countries that stood up on the same side of the fence when tyranny was coming down on us, We've got an open border allowing this stuff to come in freely. And what are we doing about that thing in particular, uh, an open border? What are we doing about it? Okay. You're talking about my freedom uh -huh. and everybody's lives who gave here, everybody who put their life down on the line, and you're saying, ah, it's okay, it won't happen to us. It's happening in France and it's happening all over. Uh, sorry, sir, what's happening? The people are saying no, because they're, these two cultures will not mix. Which two cultures are those, sir? Islam and Christianity. No, 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 sorry, sorry. okay, hang on. Let's, let's be, sorry. Democracy only works in a country like Canada. If people are free to express their fears, their concerns, their opinions, and we get an opportunity to respond to them. So I'm gonna ask you all to be respectful of the speaker's question. Uh, and thank you for, for sharing your concerns, sir. I've got one other thing I want to say about it. Okay. Is that they've openly sta stated that they want to kill us. Okay. 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 And you're letting them in. Okay. Um, sir, uh, how am I going to go on this? Canada is a country that was built by immigration. And that is what has created this extraordinary, diverse society we have. Now, Canada remains one of the only countries in the world where citizens are, by and large, positively inclined towards immigration, helping them thrive in our communities, helping them contribute to growing this country. And we are a country that you can look around any room and see the diversity that has made us strong. But we know that this has been the story of Canada. People coming to try and build a better future. And there are always reasons to be concerned, reasons to be uh, worried about someone different arriving in your neighborhood. But what Canadians have always known is that it's better for all of us if we're good neighbors.
It's better for all of us if you're looking out for your neighbor, if you're uh, understanding that we all build this success together. Two Canadians, it makes our communities more resilient, it makes uh, our, our country stronger, and it will continue to. Watch the millions of partygoers packing into Times Squares and in other parts of the world, from Australia to Dubai. They all marked the beginning of 2019. Five, four, Twenty nineteen. And not even pouring rain can dampen the festivities. Glorious, got a chance to start again. Billions of people across the globe happily welcome a fresh start with confetti, bonfires, and of course, fireworks. Thousands pack the Champs Elysees in the French capital to watch the firework display at the Arc de Triomphe. Every one of us has a native desire to live in a peaceful and unified world. As you get older and more mature, you begin to realize that there are always bad actors and people who will take advantage of situations that makes unity and peace hard to accomplish because they put their own selfish interests above everyone else's. But yet there's something in us that's saying, as Rodney King, you know, once vocalized so many years ago, can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? And the resounding echo from history is, apparently not. Apparently not. This conflicting thing is always there, and yet there's this yearning for that Edenic utopia, the desire to have a world that's filled with peace and love and brotherhood and goodness and kindness that somehow we idealize but never quite can actually actualize in our daily lives. This is the answer. This will solve all the problems. We'll move past nationalism. We'll be done with patriotism and all the extremes, as Prime Minister Macron said, it creates. This vision of France as a generous nation with a vision which carries universal values has been in those dark times exactly the opposite of the selfishness of a people which only looks at its own interests. Because patriotism is the exact opposite of nationalism. Nationalism is its betrayal. By pursuing our own interests first, with no regard to others. Actually, nationalism is what defeated tribalism and brought an end to conflict, but nonetheless, it's a whole different discussion. In other words, not just simply na nation states, but super, super states. That is, governments and countries that now may have separate boundaries will be bound together in a new kind of organizational hub, much of it being economic as opposed to being uh, ethnic or anything else that might link people together in cultures today. Basically, it's a government that he says is partly strong and it's partly brittle. And then he says the people will be a mixture and will not remain united. So it's going to be an interesting world where we talk about this multiculturalism, which is so much in vogue in our time today. It's going to be a multicultural collection of people who previously may not have found themselves bound together, but now are bound together by force, by governments, by economics, and to some degree by a universal central religious system. He tells us, secondly, that this nation will rise in a time of unprecedented difficulties in the world. In fact, both Matthew and Luke speak at length about that when they talk about there'll be a time of wars and rumors of wars. There'll be nations rising against nation. There'll be great earthquakes, famines, pestilences, he says, in various places, and fearful events. Nations, he said, will be in anguish and in perplexity. Perplexity is an interesting word because it means huge problems without any solutions. The world will be in difficulty and there'll be no solutions available to fix them. He goes on to say, and there'll be the roaring of the seas. I think about that with the, the hurricanes and the recent tsunamis that have been experienced over the last decade and even just a few weeks ago. He says, because of these things, it'll be a time when men's hearts will be failing them. They'll be fainting in terror. They'll be apprehensive of what's coming on the world. Even it says the heavenly bodies will be shaken, which is open to a lot of different interpretations. 
But basically, it's in the light of what we would call a global crisis of global proportions that the Bible says there will be introduced a new way of governing and ruling and controlling the world. Interestingly, maybe even coincidentally, that the UN Secretary General, every single one of them have been avowed socialists and committed globalists. Beginning with the very first security general, like the acting security general was first formed, was a man by the name of Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss worked for the U.S. State Department. In 1952, he was indicted for being a Soviet spy. And he, so he was way up in the, in the government system, or the, the State Department, but also was working in collusion with the Soviet Union to bring world globalism. You have men like Boutros Boutros Ghali, who served until 1996, and he simply stated in one of his speeches, the time of absolute and exclusive sovereignty has passed. In other words, he's saying the time of nation states like the United States of America, well, that time has passed. We've moved past that to a new reality, a new global government. Kofi Annan, who was also well-known, made the statement, human rights issues push sovereignty to the edge. The idea of a sovereign nation just needs to be pushed aside because we're in this new reality where human rights trump the rules and regulations of various governments. The current security Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, interestingly, was previously the president of the Socialist International, which is an organization of a of hundred different national socialist organizations. Many of them, uh, the leaders of Europe today, are part of the Socialist International Party. And their basic statement is this, the ultimate objective of the parties of the Socialist International is nothing less than world government. So we need to begin to start with this baseline to saying there is a, a strong commitment by those who are in the leadership positions, and many of them not as government officials, but technocrats who work there. They're part of the 40,000 people who work in, for the United Nations, many of them in New York City, who are committed to really pushing forth an agenda of one world government of creating a utopia where there's no poverty, there's no hunger, there's no unfairness, there's justice for all, and there's basically a average standard of living that all of us are part of. Now, I have to admit that many of the people who are pushing for this the hardest themselves are some of the wealthiest men on the planet. And many of them were not that in that position until they became part of this global enterprise, which is kind of fascinating in itself because it's just like, you know, basically the animal farm where it said all the animals were equal, but some were more equal than others. And so the very people who are going to be saying to us, we have to have an end of private ownership of property, happen to be some of the largest property owners in the world. Funny how that works. But it's kind of like Al Gore complaining about carbon date to carbon issues and he's flying around in private jets and has a fleet of Suburbans. I mean, how does that work out? And in their own minds, they need it, they justify it because they're the ones who have to fulfill their responsibility. It's interesting because the effects upon us nationally, I think, are pretty significant. Because really, when you look at the ideological divide in America today, it is over nationalism versus globalism. I mean, when you sort through all of the stuff, you know, and all the different protests, things, it always comes down to those who support globalism, which many of them unfortunately happen to be in the Democratic Party, but there's many in the Republican Party as well. And then you have people who believe that our nation should come first, that divide that's taking place has real impact. In fact, a gentleman by the name of Keith Mines, who's a security expert, he's, he was an a, 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 a army ranger and, and served in a lot of different corporate areas. He's become a, one of the foremost specialists on the cause of civil wars. What causes civil wars in countries? And he made the point that there are five conditions that he says are predictors of a nation going into civil war. Listen to what he said. The first one is intent, entrenched, national polarization with no obvious meeting place for resolution. We are divided as a country. We can't even talk to each other now. Wear a MAGA hat in public and see what happens. Unless you're in Rathdrum, you're probably in trouble. <laughs> 
Secondly, he said there's an increased divisive press coverage and information flow. So depending on what side you want to support, you can just turn the channel to it. There's one channel that's all day not hate Trump and the other side is pretty much all day we support Trump. There's this division now where the press coverage all depends on who they want to promote. Facts have no longer become objective. Thirdly, he said weakened institutions, notably Congress and the judiciary, lose their authority. Fourthly, a sellout or abandonment of responsibility by political leadership. <laughs> we have a government shutdown right now. It's interesting because the problem is simple, the solutions are obvious. It's a fix is right there, it can be done anymore. But there's an unwillingness of anybody to be identified as being on the wrong side of the issue, and so therefore they pander to us, the constituents. Regardless of your political ilk, the reason Trump got it voted is because so many people were sick of this very issue. <laughs> right or wrong, they were sick and tired. They wanted to elect somebody who wasn't a politician. And believe me, he's the most unpolitical politician we've ever had in the history of this country. Maybe Andrew Jackson was more so, I don't know. But lastly, and this is the scarier part, a legitimization of violence as the in way to either conduct discourse or solve disputes. How chilling it was to me, and I think how many people just blew it off and didn't realize that when Madonna stood up on the Capitol Mall and said, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. The tragedy of that is suddenly you're, you're having people who have unreasonable but nonetheless authority and influence on other people's thinkings saying that violence is an acceptable option within our republic. You see, I believe that the bottom line is the U.S. must be weakened to allow for the development of a one world government. Whether we're dissolved or not, I don't know. And the tragedy is that most great, all great nations, in fact, historically, if you study it, all great nations have fallen not from outside enemies, but from inside corruption. They basically implode, they don't explode. And so, we have to realize that we are living a time, most of us recognize that the country we live in today, if you're my age in particular, is not the same place you grew up. It's changed dramatically and not for the better. But I was reminded as I was doing my reading this morning, I was reading in 1 Kings 21 about King Ahab. He was a wicked king, and in fact it said he was the worst of all the kings that ever reigned over the northern king of Israel. But God told him he was going to be judged, and he humbled himself. And the Lord responds says, Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring calamity in his day. 